Hey there, Evan Enninger here, everyone's favorite British-American YouTuber, but I wasn't always British. In fact, it's kind of weird to me that my girlfriend has only known me as a British-American. She doesn't know the years of struggle to get my citizenship in this country. It was a very long, arduous journey. I mean, my brand for an entirely long time, which many of you may be aware of, was just that American guy that moved to the UK and is desperately trying to stay for some odd reason. But here I am, I've made it, and I feel like I've got a lot of good insight that I might be able to provide either immigrants who are trying to do the same thing that I've done, or just people who are into a, a good story. So grab a cuppa, sit on back, let me tell you about how I got my first ever real job in the UK. So, story starts, I moved here due to getting a tier four student visa to study in the UK to get an MSc in actuarial science. Now, it's a difficult degree, sure, but I really didn't quite grasp the difference in cultures when I tried to get a job as well. You see, on the tier four visa, you're also able to work 20 hours at any job you want during term time, and then off term time, 40 hours. I thought, 20 hours, darn, I wish they'd let me work more. You see, in the US, I managed to have an 18 credit semester while working 30 hours a week at the Pizza Hut, making main channel videos, daily vlogs on my second channel, and I got A's. In the UK though, oh my God, they don't really teach as much as they kind of talk and you have to go home and revise. And also I know coming from someone like myself who English is my first language and yet it's a different dialect. And so trying to study where all these different words are subtly thrown into conversation that I don't know of, a, a very basic one per annum. I know what it means now. I know you're like, what, easy. It's annually, sure, but little instances like that all the time where I'm not aware of what a certain word is and I have to uh, kind of pause to think and I miss a bit of the lesson, some of that really gets to you. And so I try and study. I also try to make some money because I didn't have much. And so I got a quick job working at Urban Outfitters in Marble Arch. Now, I really love working retail. I know that's a weird thing to say, but I just love people. I love talking to people and I enjoyed my time there. And I really thought that I could manage to work 20 hours a week while studying, but I couldn't. After two months, I found myself feeling like I was drowning. I was overwhelmed. Every day I'd go into class and I'd come back being like, okay, I know how much I need to study at home, but I couldn't study at home because I've got to go to work right now. And then I'd go to work and feel so exhausted by the time I came back, I didn't have any mental capacity to study. And it was a vicious cycle. And I'm not a quitter, I'm really not, but I had to, and I felt so bad about it. I remember going into work and asking to see my manager and I remember crying in the office being like, I'm so sorry I have to do this to you, but I just can't balance work and studying. And I promise as soon as I graduate, I'll be right back here and you'll see me in your office again. And he said, Evan, I swear to God, if you get a master's degree and you come back here and work at Urban, I'm gonna slap you in the face so hard. All right. Point taken. I, I just am a loyal guy, okay? The last job I'd had, I worked for five years. That's just the type of person I am. I mean, I'm making YouTube videos now for how long? So yeah, point taken. I ended up studying and doing really well that term. Thank God I got all firsts because I took the time. That being said, when I graduated, I was now in that really glorious period as an immigrant where you can get any job you want. When you're switching from tier four to tier two, you no longer have those governmental regulations put in place to block you out of jobs. For instance, when you're switching from tier two to tier two, a standard job to a standard job, well, anytime you apply for a job and a company likes you, they also have to wait 30 full days to make sure no British national also has a similar qualification because then they legally have to hire them which I really do hate. Now as a British citizen, I think I have a bit more weight to my words when I say it. I still think the most skilled persons should get a job regardless of where they come from. But that aside, you have this six month period, you can work any job you want. And so I started throwing my resume out everywhere. Okay, here's the thing though. You might be wondering, Evan, was your first job in actuarial science? Were you an actuary? They're incredibly well paid, great benefits. No, actually, for some reason, I just didn't feel like it was for me necessarily. I know I got the masters in it and I really enjoyed the math aspect, but I really felt like an odd one out the entire time I studied. No person I studied with felt like they were similar to me at all. Everyone was so focused, like their entire life's purpose was being this actuary and they had no other personality traits. And I just liked people too much. I, I didn't know if I could really see myself being this human calculator if it meant I'd lose part of myself. And so I did apply to like Ernst & Young and a couple big actuary firms, but I don't think they liked me. I didn't hear back from any of them. But there was one thing that I was actually passionate about and that was social media at the time. You see, I'd grown my YouTube channel to about 30,000 subscribers and I was super passionate about the field. It was new, it was exciting, and it was something I loved. And so 
I was like, what if I combine my love of social media and my knowledge and skill of math into a job? I applied to so many social media marketing places on websites like Indeed, which I do recommend, and even more so LinkedIn. If you're trying to find a job and you're not using LinkedIn, what are you doing? That's, that's where I got all my jobs. Very highly recommended, not sponsored by them. However, I within a week of applying, I ended up getting a bite back from a company called eHarmony. Now, I do have to say, as much hard work as I put into everything here, there is obviously luck involved. You work as hard as you can to get as many luck opportunities as possible, and I did get one. Now, eHarmony seemed interested in my profile, and they said, how long can you work in the country? I told them until January, until I need to be sponsored, and they pulled me in for an interview, telling me they needed me to give a 20-minute PowerPoint on how I can help their social media profiles, especially their YouTube channel. And this was my specialty, so I set myself to work. The thing is though, as an important note, eHarmony was not a sponsoring company. They're not on the register of sponsors, meaning that if I did work for them, it would be short-lived, and then eventually when my tier four t uh, visa expires in January, I get the boot, I gotta get out. Unless I can convince eHarmony to keep me. So I've really gotta, be really, really, really good, or while I'm also working for them, possibly look at other places that will sponsor me. That was essentially my goal, but I also needed money to live. I was no longer having a place to live. I didn't have any money in my bank account, was in an extreme debt. I needed money. And so I applied and I gave them the PowerPoint of a century. Now you might be thinking, Evan, Listen, I know how these startup, not startups, but I know how these companies work. They try and get these inexperienced people in to give PowerPoint presentations and they steal the ideas and implement them themselves. I was aware of this as well. I didn't want to put all this time into a PowerPoint only to have them say, thank you for the information, bye-bye. So here's how I positioned it. I gave them all this information, very large amount of jargon. I broke it down for them, but I wanted them to almost feel as if they have so many problems. I set up all these pins and I'm the only bowler around to knock them down. You can't do this without me. And so actually I, I had found my original PowerPoint here. Here it is, driving traffic for YouTube, a 2013 presentation by Evan Edinger. So, I looked at all of their data using some Chrome extensions. I looked at their YouTube stats, their retention. I basically just pulled from the YouTube playbook back in the day and even looked at their competitors, did some analysis for them, how to increase their engagement using a lot of different tools at my disposal. And um, one of my favorite moments, I even went through their like titles and metadata was the thumbnails because I, even like the most basic knowledge of YouTube, I was like, look at the top five in your field, faces. Everyone clicks on faces, look at yours. It's a teal background with white text. Come on guys. I then went into some more de tags, metadata, how to get up new tags. I felt very proud of this. I put so much effort into this, 20 minutes of my time, how to collab with YouTubers, advertising to spend more money. And then at the end I was like, now look what I've done. <laughs> 30,000 subscribers myself, boom. I impressed them so much. They were so overwhelmed with the knowledge that I had on the platform that I got the call back the next week and I got my first ever job professionally in the UK, earning 5,000 pounds for a three month probationary period. I was so excited I could finally afford to live in the country and kick that can down the road a little bit more. Now, I did have a good time there for the most part. I had to learn basic British etiquette, such as how to make a proper cup of tea when you get up to make one for yourself and then don't ask any other people and then everyone starts thinking that you hate them. Small offices, okay. Uh, there was a lot of drama there. And so I wasn't necessarily in love with it, but I did love being able to provide my brain for other people for something bigger than myself. And the issue was the manager kind of put a carrot on the string a couple times, like we might sponsor you, we might do it, mm, depends on how you do, which is really scary as an immigrant who might leave the country any moment now, depending on the status of his visa. So while I was getting them to possibly sponsor me, I also was applying to more places on LinkedIn that were actually uh, sponsors registered with the UK. And as luck would have it, I ended up finding the right company. I interviewed with them twice and I became a Facebook ad operations specialist, came back to eHarmony and was like, hey, thank you for the job opportunity, but thank you, I found a job that can sponsor me. They were a bit upset at me. They were like, we were gonna do it. And I was like, thank you, but I, I, I'm okay. So I got a job, I ended up climbing the corporate ladder and I made myself through many different jobs the person you see before you right now, a British citizen. It took a huge amount of effort in between every single job change, but that first one was incredibly difficult and the only way I managed to do it was by dedicating such a huge amount of time into impressing, into even if you can believe it, for a large amount of time, I had to memorize the documents 
for normal companies to become sponsors because I was so desperate. I, 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 I'd interview at companies and they'd love me. And then as soon as they found out that I was an immigrant, they'd say, actually, we're not interested anymore. And I'd be like, please, look, I literally know the 63 page document you have to fill out with the UK government to become a sponsor. I also know it's a thousand pounds. I'll even pay the thousand pounds, please. Please just sponsor me. And that never really worked. So if you are an immigrant and you're looking for jobs, I do recommend just looking, I'll put the link in the description to the list of sponsors that can. My option could have worked if I wanted to stay at eHarmony. I didn't, but in the end of the day, I got a job. Here I am now a YouTuber but it was a long journey and I'm very proud of where I've come, but I do just also wanna emphasize how much luck was at play there and also how privileged I am as someone who came from an English speaking background that it was a lot easier for me as an immigrant to get those jobs. But no matter where you are, boy, do you gotta put in that work. So hopefully uh, you've learned something from this little tale or just enjoyed this little story of my history. I do appreciate you stopping on by. I know algorithmically this isn't gonna be the one, but I like just having a sit and chat, you know? It's my beginnings, it's my roots. And I always appreciate my roots and I hope you do too. Thanks for watching. If you want to watch another sit and chat, I've got one right here. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next one next Sunday. Goodbye.